Today we're going to give you a presentation on two-way radio systems and how they work. So public versus private networks. Each network has its own place in life. The cellular PCS and data type networks that are public networks tend to be very reliable because they're built to high specifications. They are used by the general public and they are designed to be a one-on-one -on -one network. However, when you have an emergency, the network has a problem in that it gets instantly overloaded since it's available to the general public. Every father, son, mother, brother, sister, husband, wife, they all pick up the phone to call somebody and what was a perfectly operating system all of a sudden gets overloaded and essentially shuts down. So whenever you have a wide area emergency you really cannot rely on a public data network. Now here's a depiction of vehicles that are hooked up to a network. Each one is in range of a different location. And if some kind of disaster occurs, typically with a public data network you're going to find that the disaster encompasses not only the area where the where the people are with their radio but also it affects the network elements as in the tower sites so you're going to find that in many cases the tower sites are adversely affected they either uh, are off the air because of an earthquake a fire a flood and since it's inside of the disaster zone very often they are adversely affected. Even if the sites are still up and operating, you still have a problem because usually what will happen is it will lose communications with the outside world. So when you have a disaster in a particular area, all these network elements will communicate amongst themselves, but they're typically cut off from the outside world. When you're dealing with a private voice and data network, such as what we offer, the network elements are typically located a distance away from wherever you're at. And whenever there is a problem, typically you will not have any of the network elements within the disaster. Is that universally true? No, it's not. But it's very common where the network elements are outside of the disaster area. And as a result, they'll be completely unaffected if they're outside the disaster zone. In this particular example, the disaster zone encompasses four of the vehicles. And so there will be problems communicating possibly with those four vehicles if there is something wrong with the network element such as site number three or site number one if something goes wrong with those but since the those sites are actually outside of the disaster zone the chances are those network elements are going to continue to operate which means that you're not going to lose communications with any of your vehicles in this particular case the disaster zone is right around one of the network elements which is one of the radio tower sites on top of a mountain and so in this particular situation because of the fact that car number 10 and car number 11 are connected to site number 5 and site number 5 is where the disaster is you're going to lose communications from site 5 to car 10 and car 11. Car 10 happens to be in an area where he can only get reception from site number 5 but car 11 is within the communication range of site one. So car number five will just simply change to site number one. And in this particular example, what is happening here is you're losing communication with one car and you continue having communications with everybody else. So even though there's a disaster in progress, it's actually 
has very minor effect on your total operation. Now we're going to talk a little bit about basic radio principles. Radio signals tend to be a mystery to a lot of people because they can't see them and they can't you can't hear them either. So they send, they tend to be in this twilight zone area that people don't understand. Well, they really operate a lot like light. They tend to travel primarily in straight lines. This, the radio signals also get weaker with distance. When you're close to the source, it's strong. Just like when you're close to a light, it's bright. When you're far away from the light, it's dim. Radio signals get weaker when you have obstructions between you and the person to whom you're trying to talk. So if there is a building in between the two of you, the building will provide signal loss to the radio signal and the signal will get weaker on the other side. The question is, are you going to notice it? Well, the answer is yes in some cases and no in other cases. We'll get into that later. If you have a more powerful radio, it's going to talk further. Simple example is you've got a brighter light, you've got a more powerful watt light, you have a 100 watt light instead of a 25 watt, watt light, it's going, to, it's going to light up things at a greater distance. So basically what's going to determine whether or not the radio works in your particular situation is whether or not the system gain is greater than the system losses. And the system losses are the distance and the obstructions between who is talking and who is listening. Whenever your loss exceeds the system gain, then there's no communications. If the loss is less than the system gain, you can still communicate. Signal might be weak, might be a little scratchy under some circumstances, but you'll still be able to communicate. Well, here we have an example of a light hanging over a table and casting a shadow. And this example is based upon being in a vacuum. In a vacuum, when you have a light over the top of a table, it'll be completely dark underneath the table. And you can see the shadow that is being cast by the uh, light and the table obstructing the light. So this is what you would see in outer space. But we're not in outer space. We're here on the ground. And in when you're on the Earth, we have a thing called refraction. And refraction is the light bouncing off of air molecules. It hits an air molecule and goes off in a different direction. As you well know, even though you have a light above a table, the shadow that's cast will make it dark under the table, but it isn't pitch black. You can still see under the table. The other thing that happens is light reflects off of the walls. So you have this back wall and this side wall, and especially since the side wall is white in color, the light will bounce and come underneath the table so it'll uh, even be brighter underneath the table with the reflections that occur. So the table basically causes the light to be dim underneath the table, but it doesn't completely make it go away. Comparing this to radio signals, we, one thing that we find is radio signals will bend around some objects to a limited extent. They aren't perfectly line of sight like light is. The, the signals will bounce off of objects, more specifically metal type of objects, Signals will refract from the air, so they'll bounce around even more because the photons hit air molecules and cause them to bounce and go in a different direction. So because of all of these, you will find radio signals that occur in places where you wouldn't necessarily predict. And places that you would think where it should work sometimes it doesn't work as well as you think it should. 
Now here we have an example of what we call a simplex radio system. This is the simplest type of radio system. The range is limited by buildings, terrain, and all kinds of other obstructions, trees, cars, anything that gets in the line of sight path between you and the person to whom you're talking. The communication is direct from radio to radio, so when this person talks it goes direct to this person over here and vice versa. And the range on the radio is limited to how far is the line of sight between the two people. So when you're out in the country or maybe even out on the salt flats, you might even be able to get 15, 20 miles apart from each other. And when you look at each other, you might appear to be a speck on the horizon, but there's a direct line of sight path between the two of you and you can talk. But most people aren't trying to use radios under those circumstances. Most people are trying to use it in either the rural areas where your range from portable to portable is going to be typically two to five miles or in the city where your range is typically going to be just a few blocks because in the city we've got all kinds of buildings and other obstructions far more than when you're out in rural areas and as a result the range of the radio will decrease significantly. Now here's an example of two people trying to talk to each other and the ellipse around these two people represents the range of person number one with his radio. So he can talk to anybody in the area of this ellipse. And then you have person number three with an ellipse around him and you can see that person number three can talk to anyone within that circle, which includes person number two. Now in this particular situation, this is very common with simplex systems where person number one can talk to person two, person number two can talk to person number three, but person number three can't talk to one and vice versa. They're too far apart from each other. So these types of radio systems do have limitations in the real world. It gets a lot more complicated when you have many people using the radios. For instance, so here's the ellipse. Person 1, 2, and 3 are all in range of each other. And then you have person 4 and 5 who are in range of each other. So person 4 and 5 can talk to each other. Persons 1, 2, and 3 can talk to each other. But Person 1 and 2 can't talk to 4. The only person that can talk to 4 besides 5 is 3. So now you've got a situation where some people are left out of the conversation as a result of the distances involved. When you're doing a special event, such as the Special Olympics, or you've got some type of carnival going on and you're using simplex radios, it's possible for people to get too far apart from each other and you run into the situation where some people can talk to some people but not to all people. These things are very common inside of buildings that have multiple floors with steel and concrete. When you have a simplex radio system, if you have a major obstruction like a big hill or a mountain in between, the radio signal gets to the hill and basically it doesn't pass through the hill and so the person at the other end does not hear what is happening. And of course the same thing happens in the other direction. So neither of these two people can talk to each other in spite of the fact that they may not be that far apart. It's just the obstruction in between is too big. Here's another example where we have smaller obstructions. We have three different buildings and the signal when person, this person here talks is relatively strong until it hits the building and once it passes through the building it gets weaker but it's still okay. And then as it passes through this building it gets even weaker and as it passes through this building it gets even weaker to the point where the signal is either too weak to be heard or it's marginal 
scratchy at the other end. So the other person either doesn't hear them at all or hears a very weak signal. And the same thing occurs going back in the other direction. <clears throat> now we're going to talk a little bit about what happens on conventional channels. What's a conventional channel? That's the type of channel that almost all radio systems operate on. <clears throat> all these simplex systems typically operate in conventional mode. The conventional systems are like party line telephones. Everybody gets to hear everybody. And as a result, sometimes there is confusion because you could be talking to someone in your group of people and there could be somebody else completely unrelated to you on the same frequency hearing the transmission thinking it's coming from one of their people and all of a sudden they can be answering a question that you ask even though they're not part of your group and they don't have any idea of what you're really talking about so you can end up with some interesting situations <clears throat> on shared channels the law requires that you listen to make certain the channel is clear before you transmit most people ignore that requirement because they feel their communications are important so they just push the button and start talking but on a shared channel you're supposed to wait until other people are done with it with the frequency before you try to use it yourself this causes delays in your ability to actually get your message through or if you just rush it and push the button and start talking immediately then you're interfering with the other people on the frequency and that's against the rules so conventional systems tend to get interference from other users on the same frequency this happens whenever there's multiple users on the same frequency within a small geographic area when you get long distances apart and you don't really hear their radio signal then they don't really cause interference for you so only one person at from one company can talk at a given moment in time all the other people from other companies that are sharing the channel with you are supposed to wait until you're done talking most companies as I said ignore this and they just press the button and start transmitting regardless of whether or not somebody is somebody else is using the channel Exclusive channels do not have any other users on the frequency. And there are some people that do have exclusive radio channels. They're few and far between. The vast majority of people are on shared channels. Here's a typical wide area simplex radio system. In this particular case, the radio transmitter is on top of this building and the dispatch office is somewhere else and the two are connected together by a lease telephone line now that's a bit of an old technology these days actually it's usually connected by an IP data circuit so an internet connection will connect the dispatch office to the radio transmitter the radio transmitter transmits and receives from the top of the building and as a result, since the antenna is higher, which is pri the primary thing that determines the range of a radio system, you can now talk to the mobiles at a much greater distance, and the mobiles can talk back to the base station from much further away. The mobile-to-mobile -mobile range is not improved by this type of radio system. The mobiles are still on the ground talking to each other, so they're going to have typically somewhere between three and six mile range sometimes as much as 10 mile range within the city talking directly from one car to another car so although this type of system enhances the ability of the dispatcher to reach the cars at a long distance away it does nothing to help the mobiles being able to talk to each other now this is a different type of radio system this is utilizes a repeater and the repeater is basically a radio that just receives and transmits at the same time whatever it hears it rebroadcasts so when the mobile wants to talk to the base they transmit on the transmit frequency which is F1 and it gets to the repeater 
the repeater rebroadcasts it on frequency two and it's heard not only by the dispatch office but it's heard by that car and that car so everybody hears the transmission when the base talks it's the same thing that happens they talk on frequency one which is heard by the repeater receiver the repeater rebroadcasts it onto frequency two and it's heard by this car that car and that car so basically what happens is with the repeater everybody can talk to everybody within the coverage range of the range of the repeater the range of the radio system is determined by the range of the repeater since everything talks to the repeater and listens to the repeater where you put the repeater determines the coverage now a single repeater does not always provide you with enough coverage there's typically no one place you can put a repeater unless you're covering a small event within a fixed area where you can talk everywhere you want to go when you have a large city like Los Angeles there's no one place you can put a repeater where you can talk to every location within the city so people need multiple repeaters in order to get the coverage that they're looking for this solves the coverage problem but it also creates other problems that did not exist before in this particular example you've got car one car six car seven and car two that are all capable of talking on repeater number one if car number two manually selects repeater two he's not in range of repeater two and so now when he talks nobody's going to hear him if he selects repeater number three he can talk to repeater three and the repeater will rebroadcast the signal and cars four seven and three will hear what he's saying but if he was talking to car number one that's not going to work car two can't talk to car one when he's on repeater three and car one is in range of repeater one so one of the problems you run into with this type of radio system is that not everybody can talk to everybody under all circumstances it depends on where you are within the coverage area as to whether or not you can reach multiple repeaters you see that car number seven is in the intersection of where all three repeaters have radio coverage so car number seven could switch to repeater one two or three and he could talk to any car but he still has to know which car is in range of which repeater so if he's trying to talk to car number three and thinks that car number three is on repeater number two when he switches to repeater number two to call car three it doesn't work so there's a lot of manual operations that are required to make this radio system work well and it requires a lot of user training to get the people trained into doing the right thing at the right time now here's an example of what happens in a city when somebody occupies the channel and starts using the radio system here we got an example of a pizza delivery outfit and they're just covering a small portion of town they're only trying to deliver pizzas within five miles of where they're located so they set up a radio system on a particular frequency and they're the only ones on the frequency so they never get any interference from anybody else they just simply when it's time to talk they push the button and start talking well along comes a local plumber who also gets a radio system that happens to be programmed to be on the same radio frequency and the plumber is in a different part of town and since the plumber uh, signal doesn't get back to the area where the pizza delivery guy is the two of them can talk at the same time and they really don't interfere with, with each other because they're geographically separated and again we can add a warehouse type of operation to the same frequency and you notice that their coverage area is still 
doesn't overlap the coverage area, the pizza delivery of the local plumber. So here you got three companies talking on the same frequency and they can all talk at the same time and not interfere with each other. Now we come along and and add some mail delivery trucks and they're in another part of town. They're not these particular trucks are out of just one of the post offices and so the, these particular mail delivery vehicles don't go into areas that overlap any of these other three. So here you've got four different companies talking on the same frequency and they can all talk at the same time and not interfere with each other. The problem is all of a sudden the local plumber decides to expand his operation and he's expanded the area where he gets radio coverage and now you can see that his radio coverage is overlapping signal at the warehouse at the, with the pizza delivery guy and the local mail delivery and now you're finding that whenever the local plumber is talking these three people are complaining about interference to their radio systems to add insult to injury we now just added some local cement mixers on the same frequency and you can see that they partially overlap everybody else plus they're completely engulfed by the radio signal from the plumber and as a result now we're starting to get pandemonium on the frequency and to make things even worse the pizza delivery guy just expanded uh, his range on his radio system and now he's causing even uh, interference to the local mail delivery as well as the local warehouse and the plumber. So now things are really starting to go crazy on the frequency when multiple companies try to talk at the same time. And as each company expands their radio systems, adds more vehicles, or we add more companies to the same frequency, the problem keeps getting worse and worse to the point where nobody can get through and everybody is unhappy. So here is a, an example of two radio systems with repeaters that are located a distance apart from each other and you see the darker color close to the repeater and the lighter color far away from the repeater representing strong signal near the repeater where it's dark and weak signal far away where it's light and you see these two different repeaters have overlapping coverage area you can see the overlapping area right here so when when the yellow car company is talking Car number one and car number two are completely unaffected by the interference. But car number three is in an area where you can hear the signal from repeater number two. So when the vans are talking, car number three will get interference, while car number one and car number two does not get any interference. And the same thing is true in the reverse direction. When the, when the vans are trying to communicate, van number seven and van number four does not get interf any interference from the yellow cars but van number five being right on the edge may get some interference and van number six will get even more interference because the signal is stronger from the opposing radio system so this is very common in conventional radio systems modern communications have moved into a more advanced uh, type of radio system which we call trunked radio systems and they utilize trunked repeaters. The trunk system provides a much higher level of satisfaction to the end user because you have what appears to be privacy and, an, and your own private channel when you go to talk. Trunking is a, accomplished by putting several radio channels together and designing some type of automated mechanism of assigning channels so that company one ends up on channel one, company two could end up on channel three, company three could end up on channel two, company four could end up on channel five, company five could end up on channel four. It doesn't matter. Any company can end up on any channel 
but the net result is by having some kind of automatic means of assigning channels you now create the illusion of privacy for those of you that are familiar with computers it's kind of like having a VPN a virtual private network you're sharing the pipe of your data transmission with lots of other people but it's encapsulated in a mode so that you have privacy and nobody else can see it so with the radio system and you go into trunk systems you have the illusion of privacy nobody else is hearing you only one user is assigned to a specific channel at the same time so if you're assigned to channel 3 nobody else can be assigned to channel 3 in the trunking system until you stop using it once you stop using it anybody else could be assigned to channel 3 when all of the channels in the trunk system are occupied you end up getting a busy signal and that's just simply telling you that all the channels are in use it's really not that much different than when you make a call on your telephone and you get a fast busy signal instead of hearing the normal busy signal you hear the fast busy which goes er, 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 er. that is telling you that all the circuits are busy from one part of town to another a similar thing happens with the trunked radio system and since the system that we use is transmission trunked it's actually a fairly rare event that you have to wait more than a few seconds before the channel is freed up and you're able to talk on it so here's an example of what trunked radio is all about the example here is a bank teller line and there are currently four tellers that are serving customers and there are four tellers that have nobody at the window so here we have four people that have just walked in and what happens is the trunking system decides which user goes to which teller and now that all the tellers are occupied as in all the radio channels are occupied now you're going to get a busy signal if somebody else comes in so when we have three more people in line here as long as they're waiting in line that's the equivalent to getting the busy signal and the moment that one of the tellers frees up that person gets assigned a channel and the same thing happens with the next person and the same thing happens with the third person and then of course then we have more people lining up to use uh, to access the teller or use the radio system so here's an example of a five channel trunking system each one of the channels is in use except for channel number three repeater number three is currently vacant and as you can see that channel number one is currently servicing the local sheriff's department channel number two is currently servicing a taxi outfit channel number four is currently servicing this fleet of yellow cars and repeater number five is currently uh, servicing the cement mixing company so what happens when somebody else comes along and wants to make a transmission well for instance if the ambulance company pushes the button they'll get assigned channel three if this trash truck company over here decides to push the button they would get assigned channel three if both of the ambulance and the trash truck company if they both push the button whoever pushed the button first is typically going to get through and the other person is typically going to get a busy signal sometimes they push the button at exactly the same time then it becomes a bit of a fight to see who gets the channel and who doesn't get the channel and usually in that type of situation the person that gets the channel is the one that's in the better radio signal area so here is a situation where you you have multiple trunking systems there is a requirement on the part of the users to have more coverage than what is available 
in a single trunking system. So <clears throat> you can see that yellow car number one and yellow car number six and yellow car number three and yellow car number two, these four cars here, are all in range of trunking system number one. You have these four cars that are in range of two and you have these four cars that are in range of trunking system three. Each one of these trunking systems are repeaters that are located in different geographic areas. When car number one wants to talk to car number six, all he has to do is press the button and talk, and since they're on the same trunking system, they'll hear each other. But what happens if car number six switches his radio from trunking system one to two? What will happen is, when car one talks, car two and seven will hear it and car six won't hear it because he switched off to another trunking system. So this is the same type of problem that you have with a conventional radio system when you have multiple repeaters. You have to be using the same repeater system as the person to whom you're trying to talk to. And if you are not on the same repeater system, they will not hear you. So you can call car number six, and if he doesn't hear you, then you have to think, oh, maybe it's range of uh, system number two. So then you turn the switch on your radio to number two, and when you call him, then you're able to get a hold of him. But what if the, he wasn't on, uh, maybe you weren't sure he was on two, maybe you thought he was on three, so if you switched it to three and called him, he doesn't answer. So then you switch to two, and he finally answers. So there's a way to get a hold of someone but it's a little bit of a manual operation. You have to be cognizant of where the different repeaters cover, and you have to be uh, aware of the fact that you have to switch channels when you move into different areas. Uh, here we have a situation of interference between two trunking systems. This is very similar to the interference that would occur in a conventional radio system where you had two repeaters on the same frequency at different locations. The main difference between this situation and a conventional is there are multiple frequencies in a trunking system. And even if you had five channels here and five channels at this site, they were all the same channels, this system could be transmitting on channel three and five and when you get trunk to channels one, two, or four, there is no interference because they're using channels three and five. If you get trunk to either channel three or channel five, now this situation comes into play where the people that are in the overlap area will get interference from the other trunking system. And what makes it even more complicated is if the five channels that are in this system are partially the same and partially different. So you have, say, three channels, channel, say channels one, two, and three are the same as here, channels four and five are different frequencies, and in such a case uh, you can end up with some interesting results as you move from one channel to the next channel each time you key the microphone to make a transmission. All right, and of course, if you add two more sites, more, more trunking systems on the same frequencies, you can see the system gets a lot more complicated. Now we're going to talk about network trunk systems. In a network, there's multiple tower sites. The bigger the network, the more tower sites are in the network. Each site covers some area not covered by other sites in the network. And there's typically going to be overlapping coverage from one site to another. All the sites are connected together. Typically these days it's done through uh, internet protocol IP and it's possible typically to use an internet connection to connect the sites together. Sometimes it's done differently with a private microwave. It can be done by fiber connection. There's multiple ways of doing it. 
when you talk on one site, it connects to any other site where a unit in your talk group is registered. So if you're a fleet of plumbers and all of your radios are on Tower 1, and except for one that goes out of town and all of a sudden he's on Tower 7, the network will know that you have someone utilizing Tower 7. So when anybody goes to talk, it'll fire up a channel on Tower 1 and a channel on Tower 7. So everybody's in the conversation. And as your fleet spreads out to more and more towers and say you're now on Tower 1, 2, 3, 4, and 7, when anybody talks, it'll fire up a channel on channel on towers 1, 2, 3, 4, and 7. So everybody can be part of the conversation. You no longer need to manually switch sites. So the user training is very minimal compared to other types of radio networks. The radio uh, essentially utilizes a feature called seamless roaming, which is the same thing that cellular uses. And the seamless roaming basically looks at the quality of the radio signal and when it degrades to a certain point, what will happen is the radio will decide to change to another tower site. It, when it does that, it lets the network know that it's moved from say tower 2 to tower 5 and now when you, people call it'll fire up a channel on tower 5 so that you receive the transmission. All this happens automatically behind the scenes. You, there's no manual user intervention required. So here's an example of a network of trunked repeaters and we're showing three of the tower sites here's site one site three and site seven and you can see certain mobiles are associated yep. with different tower sites but when anybody talks when car one talks he doesn't just talk to the people on site one site one connects to site three and connects to site seven so that when car one talks to the repeater, the repeater talks back to car two, goes through the network to site seven, which communicates with cars six, three, four, and five, and also goes through the network to site number three, where it talks to cars seven, eight, nine, ten, and eleven. So everybody hears the transmission, even though they're spread out on multiple radio towers. And there is no requirement for anybody to change channels or flip switches to make this happen. If you have a disaster in this particular scenario, here's a disaster that occurs in this small uh, geographic area. It actually does not interfere with communications to anybody because none of the network elements are within that disaster zone. If the disaster occurs over here, this disaster zone 2, and say it adversely affects tower site number 1, you will lose communication to car 1 and car 2. But since car 2 is in range of site 7, it'll just find site 7 all by itself. You don't have to do anything. The only thing you lose is communication to car 1 because there's no other tower that is covering this area. So the network system has a certain amount of resiliency built into it that allows the system to recover to some extent when there is a disaster that adversely affects the performance of the radios. So our company, we currently operate the largest network system that's available for public subscribers. And when I say public subscribers, we're not talking about the general public. We're talking about companies that subscribe to our service. We do not provide service to individuals. We provide service to uh, business type of entities, government agencies, people that operate fleets of people and vehicles. We currently have 72 tower sites in operation with over 210 channels currently on the air. Some of our sites are as big as 20 channels and some of our sites are three channels. It depends on the traffic load. 
we install the number of channels necessary to support the traffic. We currently cover Los Angeles, Orange County, Riverside, San Bernardino, High Desert, Ventura, Oxnard, Camarillo, Simi Valley, Eastern Sierra, Central Nevada, Southern Nevada. So we have a pretty wide area of coverage. Why did we do it with digital radios? Well, the answer is simple. First of all, with everything being equal, a digital radio will give you 20% better coverage than you will get from an analog radio. So if you take the same power radio, the same antenna, same everything, and you operate it digitally versus analog, you'll get about 20% better range. So that's the first reason we went digital. The second reason is digital gives you digital clarity. It tends to either work perfectly or not at all. There's very little in between. You don't have a lot of noise and hiss and popping sounds in the background when you get into weak signal areas. It just tends to keep working until it stops. So the users perceive a higher level of quality service. Digital radios can send data at the same time as voice. For instance, you can get a caller ID sent while you're talking and you don't hear that in the audio channel. So it's possible to send certain types of data simultaneous with voice. And as a result, uh, your radio isn't tied up sending data and unavailable for voice traffic. The radios operate with a very narrow band technology and that allows the transmit power to be concentrated into a very, very narrow range of frequencies which contributes to the ability of the radio to get 20% better range. And finally, we utilize the six and a quarter technology which allows us to double the number of frequencies that we have, which means that we can provide far more capacity than other people. And that allows us to operate a system where you can get through instantly and very rarely do you need to wait because the system is busy. So having spectrum is kind of like having high-tech fuel for your race car. No radio system, no matter how sophisticated, can operate without spectrum. And if you put regular gas into a racing car, it's not going to perform right. And the same thing is true with spectrum. You can run a radio system on ordinary spectrum that is not exclusive. In some cases you can do that, but there's always compromises that occur and you're not going to be able to operate it at full capacity. It's basically like the race car where you put regular fuel into a race car and you might be able to do 50 miles an hour or 70 miles an hour, but it's going to screw up the engine and it's going to make it so that you can't do 265 miles an hour like in a formula uh, racing car. So you have to have radio spectrum to operate your radio system and the quality of the spectrum determines how well the system is going to operate. One type of station is called an FB6. These are used by many networks and it's significantly inferior because this is not exclusive spectrum. So when you are talking on the system, there's a good probability that somebody else is going to try to talk on the same radio frequency and cause interference to you. The next type of spectrum is the FB8 station, which allows the operator of the network to operate without having to uh, monitor the channel and is not responsible for for causing interference to other people. So if there's someone else on the same frequency, they don't have to stop and monitor and wait and let the system be idle while the co-channel person is talking. You have the right to just pick up the radio and start talking. Will there be interference on the channel? There could be. There may not be. It depends on where the co-channel traffic is and how close you are to the repeater versus how close you are to the interference. There's a number of things that affect whether or not you are actually going to suffer interference from co-channel traffic, even under those circumstances. The last type 
is FB8 stations on exclusive channels, which are completely uh, interference free. There's nobody else on the same frequency within any type of range that the radio is capable of reaching. So under no circumstances are you going to be subjected to co-channel traffic. The MRA system uses primarily this third type of radio channel. So the vast majority of our channels are exclusive FB8s. So here is a depiction of the radio spectrum and MRA holds radio channels in several parts of the spectrum. First we have them here in the 454 range. These, these are what we call EA channels which, which means economic area. These were auctioned by the FCC. They belong to us over a huge geography which is basically from the northern Kern County, San Luis Obispo County line down to the Mexican border from the Pacific Ocean out to the state border with Nevada and Arizona. So as a result there's nobody else on these frequencies anywhere to cause interference to us and we can place these frequencies anywhere we want, anytime we want because we own the entire geography. The next type of exclusive spectrum is what we call T-band which is short for TV band. Channel 14 on your TV set is 470 to 476 megahertz and many years ago it was taken away from TV and used for land mobile in certain metropolitan areas including Los Angeles. So we have many many exclusive channels here. We also have many many exclusive channels here which is T-band channel 20 and then we also have exclusive spectrum in the 450 to 470 megahertz range. We have some channels here which we call guard band channels that are exclusive to us. We also have channels in the 460 range which are exclusive to us. Some of them are guard band channels. Some of them are formerly uh, central alarm station channels. They came from various different look, uh, places but we've managed to acquire them over the years. So we have a huge stock of unused exclusive frequencies which allows us to make our network outperform that of anybody else. So here we have a depiction of the MRA digital network. These are the sites that we built when we first started the network. It's expanded quite a bit from this drawing but this will give you a good example of uh, what I'm trying to explain. So this ellipse right here represents the coverage of the Palos Verdes tower site and you'll notice that the Paramount Tower which is our office is inside the coverage area of Palos Verdes and we have another tower site here at South Mountain and another tower site here at Hauser Mountain and here we've got another tower site at Heaps Peak and you can see that yeah, all of these create their own coverage area none of which overlap. But as we keep adding more and more tower sites into the mix we see that we start generating overlap here. Santiago overlaps heaps and Paramount. It actually overlaps more than that but we were trying to keep the drawing to the point where it was actually readable. So here we add the coverage of Mount Lucans and you can see that it overlaps all the tower sites to some extent, a little bit with uh, South Mountain, but uh, it does overlap it as well as all the others. And then we add Oat Mountain and all these other tower sites and all of a sudden you can see that at any particular location it may be possible to access five, six, seven, sometimes even eight different tower sites. So if one tower site is acting up and you're unable to access it, your radio will switch channels to another one of the tower sites and you'll get reception from a different tower site. Here is a depiction of the coverage area of our network as it exists today. Uh, this full color map is showing you signal strength, so the red signal is good hot signal and 
it works its way through the cooler colors to where it gets down to gray where it's marginal and white there's no coverage so you can see that in the southern california area and into south and central nevada we cover a huge area we're basically covering from santa maria in the north to the mexican border from the pacific ocean we go all the way out to st george utah we cover into the coachella valley palm springs out into the imperial valley uh, where we have Raleigh and El Centro and out to Yuma, Arizona. We cover up the Eastern Sierras, most of the way to Reno. We're working our way up to Reno. So we have a very large coverage footprint. And with the networked trunking system, you can talk from anywhere to anywhere within the footprint of the network. So if you're in Los Angeles and you're trying to talk to someone in San Diego and someone else is out in a casino in Las Vegas, all of you can talk to each other, no problem. Now here is something unique that we have. We call it Next Edge on Wheels. And it's basically a portable site to add to our network. And we can deploy this in an emergency. We can deploy it for a special event and all we need is an internet connection to connect it to our network and it's off and running and we're now able to provide really solid radio coverage at the event site as well as being connected to the network so you can talk all over the network so if you're at a special event say in Long Beach we've got really good coverage of the event site with the local Next Edge on Wheels site and by connected to the network you can now talk to downtown LA, you can talk to San Bernardino, you can talk to San Diego, you can talk to Santa Barbara, you can talk to the Eastern Sierras or any other point within the footprint of the network. So these are the features of the uh, the uh, now site and here we have a depiction of a fleet of vehicles spread out over the network showing you vehicles in different locations around Southern California and since all the sites are connected to each other when you push the button to talk to the to all the vehicles it will fire up a channel on each one of the tower sites where there is a mobile registered so that everyone will hear the call. So to summarize our network, each radio, whether it be a handheld portable or a mobile, has the ability to talk to everybody within your fleet. Uh, different groups of people. Certain companies are broken up into different groups. For instance, a, a sand and gravel uh, company will typically have a fleet of cement mixers. They'll also have a fleet of sand and gravel trucks. The radio can talk to one of the individual fleets. It can talk to all the fleets at the same time or you can talk to an individual radio with privacy so that nobody else can hear that. When a unit loses signal from a tower site, the subscriber unit will find another tower site using the seamless roaming feature of the network. So it will, will find coverage from another tower site if you have not gone out of range of the entire network and it will log you into the new tower site so the network now knows that you've moved from one tower to another. When a group dispatch is made, it activates a channel on every tower where there's a unit registered so everybody hears the call at the same time. Unlike with a cellular network where you can talk to one or maybe two people then you have to hang up and call other people. This allows you to talk to everybody at the same time. <clears throat> a single channel at a site can serve an unlimited number of users so it doesn't matter whether you have five radios, whether you have 50 radios or 500 radios, 
the one channel on the site will service all of those subscriber units all at the same time. And this reduces the need for additional channels and capacity in the network, which allows us to operate the system more efficiently and provide the service at a more modest price. Each site in the network contains multiple channels, so we can handle multiple conversations simultaneously at each one of the tower sites. The number of channels at each site is dependent upon the traffic load at each site, and so we install enough channels at each site to handle the capacity under most situations. Occasionally we do get busy signals, but not very often. The pure digital signal is digital from the moment you talk into the microphone, it's digitized and it stays digital all the way to the other end of the network where it's received by the digital radio, it's converted back to analog and it comes out the speaker of the radio. Everywhere in between it stays digital. It's digitally processed which allows us to do uh, certain things to uh, make the system perform better. Everything in the network is completely digital. That provides for maximum reliability. And there's multiple redundancies built into the network as a result of the digital uh, operation. Certain things are, are automatically uh, backed up. We also provide typically backup power and uh, we try to provide backup network connections. We try to have backups for everything. So, to summarize, radio systems, conventional simplex systems are used for basic communications. They're the simplest type of radio system to implement. It requires no infrastructure to be installed ahead of time. You just simply take the radios out to wherever you're going, turn them on, put them on the same channel, start talking on them. The problem with this type of system is that the range is far more limited and you do have problems with terrain causing you to be able to talk to some people with radios and not others depending upon what kind of terrain is between you and the person with whom you're trying to communicate. You can increase the range of these simplex radio systems by adding some infrastructure, putting, the ba putting a base station at a high location, either on top of a building or on top of a mountain peak or on top of a hill. And this will allow you to get better range from the base to the mobile. It does nothing to help you mobile to mobile. You still get the same range mobile to mobile, whether it be uh, car to car or whether it be portable to portable, the range is going to be very limited and putting a base station at a high location only helps you talk from the base to the mobile. doesn't help the mobile to mobile. You can add a repeater to a conventional system which offers consistent range from base to mobile and mobile to mobile, so now the mobiles have the same range as the base station because everybody talks to the repeater and the repeater talks back to everybody else. So now the range is consistent and, and the range is defined by the location of the repeater which determines the coverage area of the radio system. Trunked radio systems offer instant channel access and enhanced user experience and virtual privacy. So when you're operating on a trunking system you have the illusion of a private channel, you don't hear other people, you typically don't get a lot of interference. Uh, not impossible, but it's certainly not something that happens uh, on any type of regular basis. And then of course when you go to the highest level of radio system, the network digital trunk systems, it uh, offers the user an enhanced experience similar to what you'd get with cellular or PCS or some type of commercial data network and you can communicate with an unlimited number of radios over any geographic area that is within the coverage footprint of the network so you can talk from anywhere to anywhere 
once you have a signal and you're logged into the network you have the range that's the same as any other radio that's on the network regardless of where you are and regardless of where they are so that's it thank you very much for listening and hopefully uh, you've learned something